Welcome to MMO Grinder's Side Quest, where I take a look at early open or closed betas, subscription trials, and simpler titles, giving you a quick first impression. Today I'll be looking at Wildstar, a sci-fi fantasy MMO published by NCSoft and developed by newcomers Carbine Studios. Wildstar was under a pretty intense NDA for a long time, but as it's nearing its launch date and running a lot more beta weekends, it's finally time to take a look at this intriguing title. The graphics of Wildstar are probably the most notable feature of this title, not so much for the quality, but overall aesthetic. In a market awash with realistic or fantastical looking fantasy games, Wildstar goes for a much more over-the-top, cartoonish and wacky style. Think something along the lines of Jack and Daxter, Ratchet and Clank, or the recent PS4 title Knack. Characters of huge expressive eyes and faces, outlandish proportions and over-the-top movements and animations. Leveling up is done in such an over-the-top and flashy manner it almost lampshades the entire concept. Oh yeah! That's what I'm talking about! The music is a refreshing change of pace in the oversaturated orchestra soundtracks of most MMO titles. While it's still very much making use of orchestras, there's more layers to the soundtrack and it's definitely more sci-fi themed than fantasy, blending elements of many genres. The sci-fi is expressed far more in the sounds, as they are very loud, explosive, and bombastic in that pew-pew laser beams kind of way. The game is also featuring plenty of voice acting, from many voice acting veterans like Jim Cummings, and despite not being able to confirm it, I would swear that this bartender is Paul Eating. What's the situation? You got another round in you? They ain't too far from here. Volume levels seem to be all over the place. Some music tracks practically scream in your ear, others fade into the background while laser fire and explosions dominate the soundtrack. It seemed difficult to really find an audio balance. To many who play this game, especially MMO vets, a lot of this game is going to feel very familiar. Two factions, set classes, four races per faction, one inherently good, one inherently evil. However, beyond the aesthetic, there's a new twist to the formula, like having paths that offer up new types of gameplay and content, depending on if you choose the path of a soldier, settler, scientist, or explorer. For example, a scientist path requires your character to scan and study the environment in the world of Nexus, while an explorer's job is to discover uncharted areas of Nexus and explore caves. This leads to players being able to discover new things in the same world depending on what path you've chosen. Combat bears a striking resemblance to Guild Wars 2 in the Secret World with some differences. You have two dodges that restore slowly, no mana required to cast skills, telegraphed enemy attacks represented by a red field on the ground, a major difference is that you also cast telegraphed attacks. You aim while casting, and depending on your class, will change up how you approach combat with each enemy. The Spellslinger seems free to move and fire their weaponry, but the class I chose, the Esper, acts more like a turret, having to stand still but being able to rotate their aim while casting high damage attacks and shielding themselves from attacks with a certain chargeable skill. The quest system remains painfully familiar, however. With a Guild Wars 2 style, it's not the same twist, as killing enemies or completing tasks fills up a percentage over a solid number. Reach 100% and the task is complete. You can turn in most of these quests over your communicator, however, some quests might come directly from your communicator. There's a quest tracker that pulls up a very obvious go this way arrow that doesn't stay up the entire time, but is nice for quick guidance. The game relies on a very heavy sense of humor, giving the overall game a very light-hearted tone. The human exiles mostly speak with a southern accent, adding to that strangely common video game trope of space rednecks. The humor is a refreshing change of pace from a lot of MMOs, as it seems the intention, not just the developers shoehorning in references to pop culture in an otherwise serious title, or translators poking fun with an Asian title that they care obviously nothing for the story about. Not to say there aren't serious moments, but it's a pretty fun environment if you're sick of all the dark stuff. It's nigh impossible to gauge community in a beta weekend of a title that's gonna be a paid title. The conversations are all the same regardless of the game you're playing, really. I'm not paying for this. I've already paid for it. This is better than WoW. This will never beat WoW. At this point, I don't foresee this game taking any real hold of the market, considering that I don't think all that many people have even heard of it, and its marketing fanfare is all but non-existent. This brings me to the most confusing aspect of this game. It's gonna be a subscription title. In this market. After all these failures and free-to-play conversions, I'm not saying it doesn't have a chance, or that it's not a good title. Hell, I'm intrigued enough to possibly pick up a copy for myself. But a monthly fee is a serious barrier for me, especially considering the lack of time that I can commit to any one title. Sure, sub-games still exist. World of Warcraft, Final Fantasy XI and XIV, the recently launched Elder Scrolls Online. But what do all those games have in common? A pedigree. A popular franchise that's attached to them. And even in cases like Star Wars The Old Republic, we see that's not always a recipe for subscription success. For a while, it almost seemed like NCSoft was afraid of this title. 
development for years with little news or marketing. An NDA that only until the weekend I was able to look at it was lifted, formally in small bits and to a select few chosen members of the press. A beta weekend schedule that is nearly fully closed to anyone who didn't pre-order the game. It's strange because this game doesn't have anything to hide, and it really shouldn't. Wildstar isn't based off of any existing property. It has no pre-existing hype to build off of. Sure, Carbine Studios is made of several developers that worked on game-changing, standard-setting MMOs like World of Warcraft, EverQuest 1 and 2, City of Heroes, and even popular video game titles like StarCraft, Diablo 2, and Metroid Prime. It makes sense that the game has such familiar tones. But they're still a new studio. They need something to get people excited. Forcing players to pay for a game they have no idea if they'll even want to play is an outdated ideal, and not the best move in this market for a brand new IP. I wish them the best, but I wish more people would at least grasp the ideal of buy-to-play. The submodel does adopt what the developers are calling play-to-pay, in a similar vein to EVE Online's payment system, meaning that with enough playtime and effort in the game, you can earn the in-game cash to buy an item that will grant you more playtime. But there's the issue. If you still have to dedicate yourself to the game, and you're going to play it that much anyway, you're already getting your money's worth out of the sub. I really was interested in Wildstar for the short amount of time I did get to play it, but I can't stress enough how risky it is to have such a traditional playing game with no name recognition hiding behind a paywall. Let me put it this way. How many of you have heard of the Elder Scrolls? And how many of you were willing to pay for the Elder Scrolls online? Exactly. This has been an MMO Grinder side quest, and it's time I logged out.